Good evening. My name is Alastair Summerley. I'm the President and Vice-Chancellor of the University of Guelph, and it's my absolute pleasure to uh, welcome you here this evening. I'd uh, also like to congratulate you. Um, this is a fine summer evening, so to see many of you here inside a building um, and to hear a lecture uh, on theoretical physics um, is an absolute compliment to your interest in subjects that probably for many of you are not um, altogether familiar. The uh, Perimeter Institute uh, for Theoretical Physics is an independent non-profit research center where international scientists are uh, working to push the limits of our understanding on physical laws and by contemplating and calculating new ideas about the very essence of space, time, matter, and information. The Institute provides a wide array of educational outreach activities uh, for students, for teachers, and for the general public, um, both here in the Kitchener-Waterloo-Guelph uh, region, but also across Canada and beyond, in an attempt to share um, the excitement created by the kind of inquiry that is going on in the Perimeter Institute. For the past four years, the Perimeter Institute has been providing an exceptional uh, series of scientific lectures to the general public. And we've reached more than 500 people at each one of these events, and then a greater audience through participation with TV Ontario, with Rogers, with the Waterloo Public Libraries, and the Institute's own growing website. The University of Guelph is particularly proud to partner in this process today. This is the last lecture in the 0506 series. Uh, Dr. Joao um, Magaju uh, <laughs> is sorry, I, the number of times I have practiced saying that, um, is tonight's um, special uh, speaker and it's my absolute privilege to welcome him here. As a visiting researcher in astrocosmology at the Institute, he arrived in Waterloo in September 2005. He's actually on leave from Imperial College in London, England, uh, where he has been a Royal Society University Research Fellow, a lecturer, and in, 19, in 2002 uh, was named a reader in physics. He's been um, a research fellow at the University of um, uh, California, Berkeley, at Princeton, and a research fellow at Cambridge. Author of a scholarly work that turned into a bestseller, uh, and now been translated into 13 different languages, it's uh, quite amazing to think that an individual who has uh, created ideas about the varying speed of light should uh, be able to communicate so readily with a vast majority of uh, people. In fact, Joao's uh, book, Faster Than the Speed of Light, challenges the famous C in Einstein's E equals MC squared. He's in great demand as a public speaker in both scientific sessions and in general section, uh, sessions on the television, on the radio, um, simply because Joao is able to uh, translate those scientific ideas and concepts into the kind of parlance that we in the general public understand. Recently, Joao has agreed to stay for another year in uh, uh, Canada and will continue working at the Perimeter Institute which I'm sure is a great benefit to the Institute and to those around. And uh, I hope, Joao, that uh, you will continue to enjoy being here in Canada. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, will you join me in extending a special welcome to tonight's speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Joao Mageju. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Um, first of all, can everyone hear me? I'm not sure. It's okay, cool. So what I will be talking about today is a somewhat philosophical issue. It might sound like a metaphysical issue. Essentially this question, could the laws of physics change? And I should have warned you immediately, I'm not going to answer the question. <laughs> and what I'm going to try and do is show that this is actually, although it sounds philosophical, it can be cast in a very physical, very physics-based um, language. And that's precisely where the idea of a varying speed of light came in, comes in. So by this I should warn you, I mean, this is not, I'm not saying the laws of physics change because we realize we made a mistake, and therefore with our perception of the laws of physics change. I mean, the laws themselves changing, and this is a really kind of controversial thing. What you're saying is that the universe is making things up as it goes along, that there is this idea that you know, the universe evolves, and the rules it uses for uh, its development, the rules themselves could actually be changing in time. And this is, if you think a bit about this, this is actually quite difficult to implement in any kind of framework because if the laws are changing, it could be there is a law above it that's telling how the laws we see are changing. So there, there could be a super law we wouldn't be seeing directly, and therefore nothing would be actually changing intrinsically, it's just we'd be looking at things at the wrong plane. So the idea that physics might be changing is that there is no such unchangeable super law, that actually the laws themselves change without something above them remaining uh, immutable. So this is quite crazy, and as I said, I'm not going to actually be talking about this as a philosophy theory, I'm going to be talking about this as a physics theory, which is where varying C comes in. So what I will be doing over the next 45 minutes or so is taking you on a tour of the craziest things that have been proposed in theoretical physics and ends the Perimeter Institute affiliation. They were just two crazy things, so this is another one. <laughs> but fear not that doing crazy things means actually understanding the mainstream very well. So I will actually be talking about textbook ideas, um, but from the point of view of trying to destroy them. But you know, it's actually the best way to describe them sometimes. So where does this start? This really starts with this guy Everyone has heard of Einstein, or at least everyone recognizes the hairstyle, atrocious, huge tongue as well. Uh, as you know, the, he's not renowned for these two attributes. He's renowned for introducing something called the theory of relativity. Even then, I think the theory of relativity has received terrible press. This is the association most people have. And I'm not going to talk much more about this, but I think well, next time you go to a hospital, look around yourselves, you're surrounded by physics equipment, which in one way or another is due to relativity. So there's always good things and bad things in the technological implications of any theory. It's ironic, and even more ironic in this case, because the theory of relativity was initially proposed as a nearly philosophical thing, as I, when I started, I talked about philosophy. The theory of relativity is initially a reflection about the arena of reality. What is space? What is time? Where do we embed things? How do things, what is the fabric of reality? And this is exactly what is behind the theory of relativity. The idea of relativistic space and time is that the speed of light, C, is a constant. So you can see how we're going to have a problem with the varying speed of light. It's like thing number one, you just throw it out. So this is what I will be telling you, and if nothing else, this is the thing I want you to take home with, that the constancy of the speed of light in modern physics is not just one more thing to remember. It's the thing to remember. You don't, you don't need to know anything else in physics, really. <laughs> so the idea is that everything in physics, how you measure things, is based on the yardstick, that's the constancy of the speed of light. How you cast things into a framework that's predictable, that's based on the constancy of the speed of light. So it's the fact in physics, it's really, even the notation, the way we write formulae in physics, has embedded inside it the constancy of the speed of light. And in fact, one of the problems in proposing a varying speed of light is writing equations in a way that's more flexible. So there's really a language problem as well in physics. 
And you can see why is it that people thought I was completely out of my mind when we came up with this idea that perhaps the speed of light is variable. So this is what we call VSL, varying speed of light. Some of my colleagues thought it stood for very silly initially. <laughs> and there's actually a lot of interesting sociology I like. I'm particularly very fond of these journalists who described us as the punk rockers of physics. <laughs> so I thought this was actually appropriate. The theory was initially proposed in the United Kingdom, so the sex pistols are appropriate here. There's actually some Canadian punk as well. The idea initially came from also the University of Toronto. John Moffat was one of the pioneers in these ideas. And what I will try to tell you is that this is not really punk physics. There is a lot of very serious reasons for coming up with something which is undoubtedly completely mad. The pedigree of the idea, however, is really quite respectable. And it goes back to Cambridge, um, St. John's College. As you can see, it rains a lot. There's nothing else to do but think about new theories of the universe. <laughs> and I was actually in this place for a while. But the person I have in mind here is Paul Dirac, who in 1930 here came up with basically the place where varying speed of light theories come from. This is really the origin historically of varying speed of light theories. Dirac is an amazing character. It's, one, it's this kind of people who is loved and revered by all the physicists. No one else really knows about him. And OK, I know his hairstyle is not as eccentric as Einstein's, but actually, I think he's a more interesting personality. And there should be some studies about him at some point. The reason why we don't know much about him is that he was really borderline autistic. He was one of these people who didn't talk at all. He was, I mean, it's, it's this kind of borderline between being in a psychiatric hospital and getting a Nobel Prize. There's something in between. <laughs> he didn't talk very much. He's an incredible person. The reason why we love him is, well, he came up with the ideas of antimatter, for instance, the unified relativity and quantum mechanics, special relativity and quantum mechanics. He really gave us a lot of, at least as much as Einstein, I would argue, um, of modern physics. But for the purpose of this talk, um, he really introduced the idea of varying constants. In a paper he wrote in 1930, and I'm going to read a bit from this paper, because I think I'm going to comment on it, because I think it's very telling. It's a very strange paper. He wrote this paper while he was on a honeymoon, which is, <laughs> I think he explained, I don't know what his wife thought about this, but. But let me read what he said <coughs> at the time. He said, one field of work in which there has been too much speculation is cosmology. We'll talk about cosmology in a bit. There are very few hard facts to go on, but theoretical workers have been busy constructing various models for the universe based on any assumptions that they fancy. This is very English, fancy. These models are probably all wrong. <laughs> it's a funny thing. He didn't talk very much, but he offended everyone whenever he said anything. <laughs> It is usually assumed that the laws of nature have always been the same as they are now. It means changing laws. You can see this coming. There is no justification for this. The laws may be changing, and in particular quantities which are considered to be constants of nature, for example, the speed of light, may be varying with cosmological time. Such variations would completely upset the model makers. It's an incredible citation. I like this very much. And the idea is that there's a massive extrapolation going from physics, we measure here and now in the laboratory, and the Big Bang, the beginning of the universe. We don't know what happened there. We don't have a laboratory there. So maybe the laws were changing. Maybe things were completely different. There is really a lot of assumptions here which should be questioned. And I, I note one thing here, actually. Changing constants doesn't mean changing laws as we will see later, is actually touching, putting the finger on something which is really quite fundamental, which is more than changing constants. It's actually changing laws. So anyway, um, it's very important to see where this comes from. I'm just going to, this is a formula. I know I shouldn't have formula here, but anyway, this is important. The reason why he came up with this idea is the following. At the time, people were worried about this other question. Why do constants of nature take their values? In other words, why is it that the speed of light is what it is? Why is it that the mass of the electron is what it is? 
etc., etc. So just to give you an example, if you take the speed of light, Planck's constant, the electric charge, and you come up with this combination, it is something which will come in later in the talk. It's something called alpha, or the fine structure constant, which is observed in the laboratory to be approximately 1 over 137. So the question is, why 137? What's the reason for this? So we do know why is it that pi is what it is. Pi is 3.14, etc., for a good geometrical reason. There's a series, a mathematical series, which gives 3.14, etc. So Heisenberg was the first one to come up with this idea that perhaps for the same reason we know why pi is what it is, we would know why alpha is what it is, etc., etc. And Heisenberg was the guy who proposed, actually, this coincidence. Actually, alpha is approximately pi over this combination of numbers. So this is not very satisfactory. This is the reason why Dirac was a bit annoyed. It's a bit like, you know, black magic. It's a coincidence. It's numerology. He became even more annoyed when people improved on this number and Heisenberg came up with this formula. So this has all the symptoms of a bad idea. This is clearly something. I mean, a good idea, things get more complicated and the idea stays simple. This is ridiculous. Okay. So the idea of Dirac was that maybe one explanation is precisely that they're not constant. The constants of nature, maybe what they are is fields, which are very rigid, take a, soak up a lot of energy to, to, to vary in space and to vary in time. And therefore, they give us the impression that they're constant. But they're only constant because we live in a very boring environment, in a very cold universe. If you go near the Big Bang, and you can soak up all the energy in the Big Bang, or if you go near a black hole, then the fluidity of these fields would become apparent, and in fact, you would see that these constants are actually variable. So the idea of Dirac is that, then the question is why things crystallize where they did. That's a completely different perspective than trying to find arcane fundamental reasons like relating pi with alpha, etc., etc. And this really changes the perspective. I mean, physicists are incredibly obsessive people. I don't know if you've noticed this. But an example is this guy, Wolfgang Pauli, who was completely obsessed with the idea of why 137. He spent all his life trying to understand this number to the point that when he was taken to hospital to die, his terminal disease, he actually insisted on being put in room number 137. <laughs> which is an exaggeration, I would say, of obsession. And you see, from Dirac's perspective, there is nothing particularly specific about 137. Just wait another 10 billion years, and you'll be asking for room 138. There's nothing really special about 137. So this is the background. This is where we came from. Now this is like for physicists. You know, if you're not a physicist, it's a bit. I have a few slides which are a bit more advanced. But the important thing here is to recognize that if you, if you go for varying constants, there's quite a big difference between which varying constant. So some constants are really structural, like the speed of light. If you're a physicist, you recognize a few others. So they're structural because they're used to build up the whole of physics. And then there's other kinds of constants, like uh, Newton's g is like a, the strength of gravity. Other things are like the masses of the elementary particles. That's what I call descriptive, et cetera, et cetera. There's all kinds of different types of constants. And whenever you talk about varying constants, you should never generalize. So if you're a physicist, you can certainly recognize that these things play very different roles. So historically, it's not surprising that varying constant theories, until quite recently, were mainly varying Newton's constant and varying electric charge theories. That's really the kind of thing which Dirac had in mind, not even Dirac was this crazy, to consider a varying C and a varying Planck's constant. Because what you're doing, really, then is asking, are we going to mess up with the whole of physics? What happens? if the varying constant we have in mind is actually the speed of light. So what are you doing, really, goes back to this guy, Albert Einstein, this patent clerk who, in 1905, changed the foundations of physics to make C the big foundation. And that's what I'm going to tell you about in the next five minutes. What is exactly relativity? Why is the constant of C so important? 
why is it that physicists become hysterical if you talk about varying speed of light and they think you're mad? There's actually a good reason for it. So there's a terrible misunderstanding around, I uh, read somewhere, that only 10 people understand relativity. And it's completely wrong. I think actually only 10 people don't understand relativity these days. Because actually there's a few things I don't understand, I have to say that. And it's only after a certain point that you start understanding what you don't understand. It's complicated. But, but if you don't take things too deeply, the relativity is really a very simple thing. I don't see why it, people shouldn't understand. And the crucial thing, as I said, the only thing you need to remember is the constancy of the speed of light. Now, this is a crazy concept, and essentially what you're saying is the following. So this being North America, I'm sure you all drove here, and you know, if some of you got a traffic jam, as other, I don't think anyone flew here, but anyway, it's a possibility. And one thing you notice is that um, your speed with respect to the other cars changed whether you accelerated or you braked. That's why you accelerate and you brake. You know, you change the speed of your car with respect to the other cars. Now imagine a car which is a light ray. The statement in relativity is that the speed of this car with respect to your car is the same, regardless of what you're doing, regardless of whether you're stationary, if you're moving this way, that way, if you accelerate, if you brake. If you measure the speed of this light ray, you always get the same thing. And this is completely mad. I mean, this is completely crazy. And all you're saying, in a way, immediately, is that some of these preconceptions about what is space and time has got to break for, to accommodate this idea that the speeds, the relative speeds, uh, are not just additive things, but actually they stay constant if you have something like a light ray. So clearly you've heard about the solution. Uh, the solution is the following. The only way for everyone to measure the same speed of light is for time and space to be relative. So if the speed of light is the same for all these cars, the way time and space is perceived has got to be relative and be different for, the, for all these other cars. And specifically, the conclusion of relativity is that time dilates for moving observers. If you have two twins and one goes around the universe very fast, when it comes back, the one that stayed at home is much older. And things contract in the direction of motion. They kind of squeeze if they move it. So to some extent, moving close to the speed of light is the ultimate health diet. It keeps you young. And, and it slims you as well in this direction. So it's two things in one. It is basically what is inside relativity, these two concepts. So this is one thing to remember. This is very important later on for various things I have to tell you. The other one, which is very annoying for science fiction films, is that the speed of light is a speed limit. So if the speed of light, if this guy doesn't change its speed, regardless of what I do, I can accelerate, I can brake, I can do whatever I want, I will never overtake light, so light is a speed limit. And this means that, really, we are stuck in our corner of the universe. To get out of the galaxy it would take a million years, properly. And this is really a complete disaster for science fiction, if you think a bit about it. So this is, in a nutshell, what relativity has to tell you. And it has become so ingrained in, the, in actual what people know in general, like the general resonance box of facts. People know that the other day, last time I had a birthday, someone sent me a birthday card with Einstein. And this is one of the most insulting birthday cards I've ever got in my life. Upon opening it, it says, the speed of light may be absolute, but age is relative. Have a great birthday. <laughs> so this is the level everyone has heard of these effects. They're actually measured in the laboratory. They're accessible to measurement in the laboratory. And this is basically what we are throwing out. So the punk rockers is means essentially throwing out these things which you may not appreciate it, you know about these effects, but you may not appreciate this is really the foundation of everything in physics. And what you're doing here is basically asking the question, is this really that rock solid? Are there good reasons for giving this up? Why are we doing this? So before addressing that question, uh, I always like to put a sociology point here, which is not widely known, but I think is very important. And it's essentially that this guy here, Albert Einstein, was actually the first person to propose a varying speed of light theory. In 1911, 
This is not widely known, and he did it for reasons which, meanwhile, you know, it changed his mind. But the point remains that the man who invented what is now a dogma wasn't dogmatic about it himself. He was the first person who was ready to give up the constancy of the speed of light if he could see a good reason for doing it. So this 1911 theory is irrelevant for the rest of the talk, but does make this point. If you have good reasons in physics for giving up what you think is a good, strong foundational principle, you should. Uh, this is basically the message you take from this. Of course, there are many jokes about this, completely inappropriate. Einstein was in Prague at the time, and people have made comments about the lifestyle he had in Prague, which was completely, you know, anyway. But he did actually come up with his papers, which I think are very important. So for the rest of this talk, this is basically what I'm going to be telling you. I'm going to be introducing the main reasons for proposing a varying speed of light theory. What exactly motivated us? And I'll tell you about two things. One is cosmology. That's um, essentially the reason why initially the idea was proposed. More recently is this search for the grand unif unified theory. I'll briefly tell you about what is a grand unified theory, why we're trying to unify everything, why are people at Perimeter Institute going completely crazy about this and wasting their time on things which will never go anywhere, or maybe they will, we don't know. Uh, there is a connection between these two things. And then finally, I'll tell you why there is actually some observational evidence for a varying speed of light. So this is the three things I want to tell you. And then I may finish with some philosophical discussion on what is variability of the laws of nature and why is it that it's better to cast this philosophical concept uh, in the framework of a varying sea. It's very easy to waffle and waffle and waffle about varying laws, but you need some framework for things to actually be meaningful, and I think a varying sea is a good example of that. Okay, so let me tell you a bit about cosmology. This is, a, this is what I normally write as a job description in visa applications, and I go through passports, through airports and things like that. People always look at me very strangely, cosmologist. What is that? Is it a priest? Is it an astrologer? What is it? And, it's, and it is indeed a strange concept. When you, I hadn't appreciated this until recently, but you're asking momentous questions. You're asking, where did the universe come from? How big is the universe? How old is the universe? And ominously, will there be a name for the universe? So they're really quite deep questions, which used to be the preserve of theology and which now we're saying, oh, this is a branch of physics. So whenever I say, oh, no, I'm a physicist, people think I'm lying, because at this point, you know, why is it physicists build bridges? That's completely different, addressing these questions. But the idea behind cosmology is that the physics behind building a bridge and the physics behind addressing these questions is exactly the same. And you should use the same tools for addressing these questions. So cosmology is actually an experimental science. Um, not that we can repeat the experiment, obviously. You cannot go and produce a universe in the laboratory. But the idea is that you can look at the end product with a telescope. And this is what this guy did. This guy is, is called Edwin Hubble. He's a very important, influential cosmologist. He's the first cosmologist. He's the guy who opened up the idea that the universe is made of galaxies, a much bigger thing than what we thought. Funnily enough, he was a lawyer. He gave up his job. I think he had personal money, so he didn't care about it anyway, but he found that it was much more interesting to look at the sky. And what he discovered was something completely crazy. He discovered that if you look at the universe with the right techniques, the universe is bigger than what we think. It's not made of stars. It's made of much bigger things called galaxies. And what actually happens is that the universe is expanding. So what he discovered is that the galaxies are receding away from each other. Now, there's a lot of misunderstandings about these. Uh, the expansion of the universe is really not a real movement. So it's more like space is being created in between things. This is the expansion of the universe is not the movement of galaxies receding away from each other. It's the creation of space in between the galaxies. So it's a bit like you have a city. You build things. Space appears between the buildings. So you build a park. Space appears. You build more and more buildings, and more and more space appears. So it's like every urban architect's dream. It's something which goes on forever. There's like a creation of space. And that's what is happening inside the universe when you say the universe is expanding. And you should think of it that way 
rather than the idea of something moving, the galaxies moving. But what really comes out of this is that if you rewind the film and you now ask, okay, if space is being created, was there a time in the past when there was no space between things at all, when all the space had been removed? And the answer is yes. If you rewind the film, sometime between 10 and 15 billion years ago, everything was in one single point, and there was actually no space in between anything in the universe. And this is completely crazy, but this is basically what comes out of what we call nowadays Big Bang cosmology. Now, Big Bang cosmology is very successful, but it's not a bed of roses. There are lots of problems. And when I was in grad school, we were told about all these successes, but we were given like homework problems, solve, go and invent a new theory and solve these problems with the Big Bang. And let me tell you the simplest one, there's like about seven or eight, which are like classic staples of problems with the Big Bang theory. I mean, the, mo the most obvious one is where did things come from? If things were in a point, what happened before? It's the most obvious one. But another, an example of something else is something which we call the horizon problem, which I selected not because it's the most complicated problem, but because it's probably the easiest one to relate with the varying C. So the idea is the following. I told you two things now. I told you that according to relativity, the speed of light is a speed limit. And I told you one thing just now. I told you that the universe is a finite age. There's a finite time between the moment of creation, the Big Bang, and nowadays, 10 billion years, say. So immediately you find the following conclusion, which is that any form of contact in the universe has to have a limited range of action. So if the speed limit on a given highway is 100 kilometers per hour, and I have one hour, and if I stick to the speed limit, of course, um, I cannot go beyond 100 kilometers in one hour. So likewise, in a universe which is 10 billion years old, there must be some kind of horizon, some kind of region beyond which I cannot travel, I cannot propagate, I cannot get information across, which is the distance the light would have covered, which is actually 10 billion light years. So this is something which we call the horizon effect in the Big Bang universe, and immediately the problem is that the horizon gets very small as we go backwards in time. So when the universe is very, very young, the distance that information can have traveled is very, very small, because the speed of light is still the speed limit, and now I have less and less time. So you end up with this picture that the early universe, the baby universe, is completely fragmented into this completely disconnected regions, which we call the horizons. This is very serious as a problem, because then, as physicists, we want to explain why is it that the universe is the same everywhere we look. Same radiation, same galaxies, same properties everywhere we go. Well, normally things become the same by coming into contact with each other. So I have hot things, cold things, I bring them together. Same temperature, milk and coffee, I stir it, milky coffee, etc., etc. I would like to have a similar reason for uh, why the universe is so homogeneous, so the same everywhere. And what you say with the horizon problem is that because I have this fragmentation of the universe into regions which are completely oblivious of the rest of the universe, I cannot have such an equilibration mechanism because I don't have contact between things. So this is really, at the simplest way, this is really where the varying speed of light theory comes from. So I very much like this statement by Landau, cosmologists are often wrong but seldom in doubt. It's a great quote, and I think it's true. People, uh, this goes also to, back to the Dirac honeymoon paper, where he actually question about how certain cosmologists are of everything all the time. So they get into problems because they assume too much, and then they get stuck and they just continue to assume too much. And I think it's completely obvious that one way to solve this problem is precisely to raise the speed limit in the early universe. This is the most naive thing to do, and indeed there's nothing particularly intelligent about this. The difficult thing is now to come across with something which is a theory which has a varying speed of light and which explains the horizon problem. So this is essentially where a varying C came from initially. It was basically this kind of insight uh, about you know, solving the horizon problem just by allowing things to travel faster in the early universe, very much faster than nowadays. The thing which has been very difficult over the past 10 years or so is do this consistently and come up with something 
which is as solid as relativity, but which contains this feature. So this is one aspect of the story. Let me tell you about the other two. Well, the, other, the second one is really quite a tough one. The second one has got to do with unification. And this is one thing which you may have heard, this is what physicists, theoretical physicists, are all trying to do these days. They're trying to do something which is to bring together lots of theories into a single theory. So electricity, magnetism, nuclear forces, gravity. The idea is that at the moment we have all these different theories, it's like different political parties or whatever. They, they have, there's very different ways of describing different aspects of nature. And what you'd like to do is to have one thing which unifies all these different theories. So this is actually widely known because of this picture. This is Einstein's office, as he left it just before he died. And this is the thing he was trying to find out at the time. So the idea of a grand unified theory, something which would bring together gravity, light, electricity, magnetism, etc., is the thing he tried to do until the end, and which he failed completely. We haven't done much better, and I found myself stupidly trying to read what he was actually writing. Maybe there was a solution there. There isn't, and uh, if you go to perimeter, you find people working on this very hard. There are different approaches, string theory, loop quantum gravity, these various things. To be fair with you, this has been 100% failure rate. We haven't succeeded at all in, in solving this problem. It's actually a curious thing. When I was in Cambridge, people had this terrible habit um, of setting exam questions, which were problems no one could solve. And um, this is crazy, and it's completely, of course, people fail the exams and things like that, but amazingly enough, there's actually instances in the past where people solved these problems. And Maxwell, for instance, is one example of someone who solved Stokes' theorem before actually Stokes could find a proof himself. So under the pressure of an exam, sometimes you really have good ideas, obviously. <laughs> so I'm not aware of anyone trying to play this game and, like, unify gravity with the rest of the, the forces of in, in an exam question. But this would, this would be a very good example of something which could go as a question like that. So let me just tell you my perspective on this and why this relates with the varying C. Um, I'm not going to give you the answer, and I don't think anyone has the answer, but I think now we know why we have failed. And this is something which goes for a very simple reasoning. This is basically three steps. And this goes back to things I introduced during this talk, so you cannot complain and say, I don't know about that, because I've, I've told you about that already. But the basic point is that is gravity is the thing that always stands apart. So it's actually very easy to unify light, electricity, magnetism, and nuclear forces. The difficult thing is gravity. Gravity is the thing that does not want to be unified. And the reason is, as we understand it, gravity is a property of space-time. So this is what Einstein told us, gravity is the curvature of space-time. And the forces other than gravity, for instance light, are quantized. Quantized means that things are discrete. They come in atoms, in things which cannot be divided any further. Atoms in the Greek sense of the word, of course. So basically, for instance, for, for light, the atoms of light are called photons. And this is well established. So, you know, basically you have all these theories which come in quanta, if you want to unify gravity with everything else, you have to quantize gravity, because you cannot have a unified theory in which one half is quantized, the other half is not. So we have to quantize gravity, but this means quantizing space and time. And this is really quite crazy, because what you're saying is that space and time are not a continuum. They should be made of atoms. They should be made of potholes, so to speak. So in other words, the time should not be like something which is just flowing continuously. They should be like steps. And space is not something where you can move smoothly around, but there should be like potholes and you have to leapfrog over them if you really could go that small. So unifying all the forces of nature means proposing something called the Planck length and Planck time, which would be the atoms of space and the atoms of time. So this is the idea, but then you get, immediately you get a paradox. And the paradox is, you know, ask what kind of objects would perceive the effects of quantum gravity. And clearly you need something which is very small, because if you have something which is big, you just skim through the potholes of space. You need, some, you need a microscope or something really small that would be forced to leapfrog over these 
quanta of space. And immediately you see what well, is the problem. So the question is, is something big, is something small? Well, I told you one thing, so it was like my, my Atkins diet, you know, length contraction. You basically have this problem. You ask different observers if something is big or small, and they disagree, because of course length is not an absolute. So this is the reason why, to my mind, we have a contradiction in terms. Essentially, we're trying to you, we're trying to combine two things that one says yes, one says no. We're trying to quantize gravity. At the same time, we're trying to do it with relativity on top. And relativity does not let you do that because of this contradiction. So what we need, sorry about this, this was an accident. <laughs> what we need is a theory where length contraction is something that switches off, not for all things, not for big things, but when things become very small. And well, what this means is basically when the wavelength of a given light ray becomes this small, one way to do this is to say the speed of light goes to infinity. As you know, an infinite speed of light means the pre-relativity space in which space is absolute. So the only way to my mind to implement something that's not a contradiction in terms is to have something which has a wavelength or an energy or a color dependent speed of light in which the speed of light diverges, it becomes infinite when the wavelength becomes very small. It's a bit more physics based, but you can see that essentially what I'm saying is that a color dependent speed of light is a way to get out of these contradiction in terms which is behind quantum gravity. So people always ask, what is E equals mc square in this theory? I always give the answer. It's not as iconic as E equals mc square. I wouldn't put this on a t-shirt for sure. But this is, if you look at this a bit, this is actually the kind of um, equation which has this property that there is an invariant division between quantum gravity and classical gravity. And therefore, you don't have a contradiction. And I should say, this is something which has now become known as doubly special relativity. It's not a solution to unification, but it's something which is like a middle ground, which is not really um, the final answer to unification, but it's more like a way of trying to sip observations, to get observations into the theory before we have the final theory. So let me move on to the next thing, the last thing I want to tell you. Last thing I want to tell you is actually about observations. The last two things were really very theoretical. And all I gave you is my perspective as a theorist, as a cosmologist, as someone working on quantum gravity, for why it would be a good thing to have a varying C. But of course, in the end, the question is, is it true or is it not true? And this is something which came surprisingly a year after we wrote our first paper on varying C. Sometimes you get these surprises. There were some astronomers looking at the sky, looking at measurements of things which can be seen as measurements of varying C, of C in the early universe, and they found observational evidence for these variations. So this is quite a strange thing. I, I should tell you that I'm going to concentrate on one type of varying speed of light theories, the ones in which there's variations in time. I told you there's theories in which the color is a, a factor as well, but they're more complicated. They also have interesting implications. And this is what happened. So at the time, there were a number of people working with this telescope in Hawaii. People always ask, why Hawaii? It's actually, there's a good reason for that. It's not just a nice holiday at the end of, of the observations. But this is the Keck telescope in Hawaii, where there's really a very, a very good way of looking at the very deep universe, the very early universe. And this is something which is not widely appreciated, but uh, cosmologists, in a way, are much better off than archaeologists. Archaeologists are people who have to rely on relics of the past. Whereas uh, cosmologists can just look directly into the past. The reason being that when, the, when you look at the star which is very far away, you're looking at light that left a long time ago and has been traveling towards you. So if you look at something which is, say, a billion light years away, you're looking at light that left one billion years ago and has been traveling towards you and now we have this really kind of, there's this time lag between observing and emitting that allows us to look directly into the past. So we're not inferring the past, we're actually looking into the past when we look very far away. When I say far away, that means long ago. So far away, long ago are equivalent in, in observational cosmology. 
And what these guys have been doing is looking at these beautiful things called quasars. So these things are really, really on the far outer edges of the universe. These things are close to 10 billion light years away, which means we're really looking at the very, very early universe, not quite the Big Bang, but we're looking at the universe very, very early on. This is the baby universe, really, we're looking at. And what these people found is that they could actually measure this crazy thing which led Pauli to go into room 137. So the fine structure constant, I told you, was going to come back to haunt us. It is here again. What these guys can measure is actually alpha as it was at the time at which this light was emitted. So you can see immediately you have access to these various things, the electric charge, the speed of light, the Planck's constant. You can measure this combination very accurately by looking at this light from quasars. So they developed this technique. Basically, the idea is very simple. You just look at this light, and it contains these, these lines. So if you, if you just have a dispersion of this light with the prism, you get the, the rainbow. Typically, you find these lines on top of it. And these lines describe the way the atoms, the different levels in energy in the atoms, as they were at the time. And you can actually look at the way these things split. And basically, the way these lines split gives you a direct measurement of this quantity alpha, which I described earlier on. So what they've done, this is, an this is very easy to say, this is an incredibly difficult thing to do. And this has been going on for maybe seven years now, and this is what they found. What they found is, if you just plot the look back time, so this is further and further back in time, further and further away in space, and this is essentially the plots of what you see for alpha. And you see that alpha becomes smaller. This is blown up. It's a tiny thing. We're not talking about the big variations we, we need for explaining the horizon problem. We're talking about the residue some 10 billion years ago. And this is basically what they seem to have observed. They seem to have this very, very kind of nuance here, this feature, which is very significant. It's controversial, and this continues to be in dispute, but I think it's interesting. There might be some observational evidence for a varying alpha. Now, everyone always asks at this point, so what does this mean? Is it a varying C? Is it a varying E? What is it? And I don't know if there's any physics students here, so I'm going to leave this as a problem for the student. <laughs> and I'm going to give you a hint, though. So, so this is, you can actually address the question. If you have a varying alpha, is it a varying C or whatever it is? So think a bit about this. Where do the constants of nature come from? So typically, they're very closely related with our understanding of what are the units of measurement. The constants of nature are things that don't change. The units of measurement shouldn't change. I don't want to measure things with a meter stick that keeps changing back and forth. Okay. So the units of nature and the constants of nature are very closely related. And for example, it is again for the physics student in the audience, Newton's law is the statement that the force of gravity decreases with this combination, and therefore you get this proportionality constant that's Newton's constant. Well, Galileo, before Newton, thought actually the acceleration of gravity was a constant. So this is what you use whenever you launch a rocket into space. Gravity becomes weaker and weaker. In height, Galileo thought it was the same. He kept going up, and the acceleration of gravity was the same. Now, this confuses a lot of physics students, which is why I like to do this. <laughs> Consider now that I decide to do the measurements with the pendulum clock. So the pendulum clock is something. I go to the moon, and instead of taking you know, an electronic clock, I take a pendulum clock. It's a bit stupid, I know, but you just take a grandfather's clock to the moon, and that's what you use to measure time on the moon. It's a bit surreal, a bit ridiculous, but if you think a bit about this, if this is your unit of time, this is the valid law i.e. Newton's law is actually wrong, and Galileo's law is right, if I insist on going around the universe with a pendulum clock instead of a, you know, a normal electronic clock. Now, electronic clocks actually tick with alpha. Alpha is the thing which determines how your watch ticks. And basically, if you have a varying alpha, effectively what you're doing is taking a pendulum clock around the universe. It's equally stupid, really. So, you know, basically by addressing these issues of how should we define units, this is not metaphysics, but by addressing this issue, 
you will actually answer whether you should have a varying E or a varying C if you have a varying alpha. So I really hope there's not too many physics students here because you're going to be really confused. This is a perfect way to, to destroy. I mean, there's a lot of tautologies in physics textbooks. I don't know if you've noticed it. You define one thing, the other thing is defined by the other, it's like a loop. And you know, this is one example of where you could put the finger on it. So before I finish, um, I'm going to wrap this up exactly. This is the three things I wanted to tell you. And basically, let me go back to the philosophy, the philosophical issue. Could the laws of physics change in time? Well, this is a very deep question. And this is something I can, I can be here three hours talking about it. it. can be 48 hours if you want. But let me just give you like a, you know, basically the short answer is it's extremely difficult to preclude the existence of a super law uh, telling you how the laws you observe changing are changing. So cha if, if the laws of physics are to change, there cannot be such a super law which doesn't change above them. And the only way I know of to do this is exactly we having a varying C, because the speed of light is so ingrained, so embedded into the way of formulating the laws of physics that if you have a varying C, and if you do it brutally, then essentially you have variability in the physics, in the physical laws immediately. And this can be done in a way that's viable experimentally if done carefully. So it's a crazy perspective. You're basically saying the universe might come out of the nothing without laws and then invents the laws. And things just crystallize into a stable, C is not very much, laws are not changing much, a stable scenario. But basically the reason why that happens may be a circumstantial reason rather than a fundamental reason. And I think I should leave it this year. Let me just conclude. As I said, if I start going on this, it's going to be three hours. So maybe let me just conclude by stating that the varying C theory is quite a strange thing, given that in 1905, Einstein proposed the, the theory of relativity. It's curious that actually the first varying constant theory I know of was proposed by Kelvin experimentally in 1874 and was a varying speed of light. So this kind of openness of mind was something which was possible before 1905. Then Einstein came up with his theory, and look at this amazing statement. In 1930, Eddington said, the variation in C is self-contradictory. This is an incredibly stupid thing to say, if you think a bit about this. This is not something which is actually doing relativity any favor. You're saying that the constancy of C is actually a definition. It's nothing physical. Of course, it's not true. In fact, what has happened is that the physical reasons, the experimental reasons that led to relativity theory, by 1930 had been forgotten. And people had become completely embroiled in the mathematics of relativity without realizing that actually things could have been different. And the quote I like very much from Einstein, which comes from around the same time, is that since mathematicians invaded relativity, I don't understand it myself anymore. <laughs> and I think this is the situation we're in at the moment. I think a lot of the physics which is behind relativity has been forgotten, and now it's everything just so much formalism, so much mathematics, that people forget that things could have been different, and maybe there's good physical reasons for them to still be different. Relativity was really due to experiment, not to mathematics, not to self-consistency, as Eddington claimed. And if something is due to experiment, I like this quote as well, and I'll finish with it, quote from Hertz, what is due to experiment may always be rectified by experiment. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are you comfortable uh, responding to questions? There are, I think, some microphones around for that people have. So if you would just like to hold your hand up and a microphone will come your way. Could you just wait for the microphone to arrive um, before you uh, start your question? Thank you. If the speed of light can be variable, is it, uh, would the speed of light change all over the universe uh, at the same time as the universe uh, aged? Or is it possible that the speed of light could be different 
in different parts of the universe? Yeah, very good question. Um, so when I say the speed of light changes in time, it's in the same approximation, which isn't very good, in which I say the temperature of the universe changes in time. Of course, it's not exactly the same everywhere. So in that approximation in which I smooth all the galaxies and everything looks the same everywhere, the only variation is indeed in time, but I have to look big if this is to make any sense. If I look small, if I look around the solar system or near a black hole, then the variation is in space, as you pointed out. And this is something that comes out of the equations. So what you do is you come up with a theory in which the speed of light depends on the environment. If the environment is the same everywhere and is changing in time, like these models of the universe, which have this approximation, then it's just a time variation. If the environment is changing in space, as when you go around a black hole, then the speed of light changes in space as well. So that's the answer. Um, my question is, uh, one of the first premises where you talked about as the, the wavelength varies to the Planck length, first I wondered if you could say, do you, do you pick that because of the string theory implications? And second, if C approaches infinity at that point, does that mean, cause, because you were talking about the horizons, that there are no horizons and that was your point that everything would then interact? Well, that's a good question, and actually the answer is not very obvious. <laughs> um, so initially I thought that indeed um, you could, if you could break, if, the speed, if, if, you could have, if you could break the speed of light with something which is smaller wavelength, you could get out of the horizon. It's actually not true. When you look carefully at the equations, it's actually not true. But, you know, it's, it is actually the, the, the intuitive thing, is that you would be able to get out of the horizon. But it doesn't work that way when you, when you do everything properly. Uh, yes, uh, you were positing the idea of a super law. I was wondering if you could explain what what your thinking is behind. Well, that's that. the kind of thing which could. I mean, I could be here three hours, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so the the idea of a super law. No, it's exactly the opposite. I was positing that there was no such thing as a super law if if I saw the laws changing in time. So my definition of variability is suppose I have some law of physics and I see it changing in time. Then if I find a way, some pattern of changing, and I say, this is the law which makes this law change, then this law isn't changing, therefore there is a framework for non-variability. So if you say there's variability in physics, you're saying there is no such thing as this super law. Now, what this means physically is the following. And this is, okay, I'll try to stick to two minutes. I'll do my best. Okay. But basically, uh, in, in physics, every time you have a quantity, you really have an invariance associated with it. So, for example, there's no preferred direction in physics, fundamentally. There is one quantity. It's called angular momentum. Okay. And if you ask, what is the quantity associated with the invariance of physics in time? It's, it's the energy, which is a quite entertaining thing, if you think a bit about it. This, this theorem is due to Amy Noder, a lady who did a lot of very important work relating symmetries with conserved quantities. So the question is, so far, whenever you find that energy is not conserved, you basically say, oh, yeah, I just need another form of energy, and the grand total will be conserved. So energy can change form, but the grand total has to be the same. The underlying principle is that physics does not change in time. That's exactly what Noda's theorem tells us in this case. If you say that physics is changing in time, then you have to be very careful now you do this, because you can get something completely crazy, namely that energy can appear. If there is a super law, all that, is, uh, all that happens is that there is another form of energy that keeps the grand total constant. But if there is no such thing as a super law, you can't do that. And there's a mathematical way of formulating this, that you can't do that. Now, violating energy conservation is a bit crazy, but maybe that's what we need to create the universe. The things just appear suddenly, you know. Clear violation of energy conservation. So as long as you're not doing this nowadays in a way that's obviously in contradiction with observations and with experiment, this is exactly the kind of thing you may need for a cosmogony for the beginning of the universe. So variation of laws, absence of a super law explaining it, 
and energy not being exactly conserved are three things that come together. And what looks like a philosophical question, can physics change in time, is actually a very well-defined physics problem in the end. Hey there. Um, you with me? Yep, over here. Yeah. Where is it? Hi. Um, you mentioned there was, a, there was an equation there that you wouldn't put on a t-shirt. Um, I'm wondering, do you think there's a good reason to strive for elegance in physical theories? Say it again, sorry. Uh, do you think there's a good reason to strive for elegance in physical theories? No, I think people have, have pursued elegance too much. I'm very happy to be ugly. I mean, I don't care about these matters. <laughs> I, I think there's been a lot of obsession since Einstein with beauty in, in science. And, and this is exactly the problem, actually. The, I think the reason why we're stuck in quantum gravity is that we think we can get there just by seeking beautiful formulae. And I think it's, it's exactly the opposite. What we need is observational data, is experiment, is input from the real world. Just because Einstein managed to get relativity seeking beauty doesn't mean we're going to be able to do that. I think there's a certain arrogance here, which is people seeking beauty like Einstein did, hoping that to get there just by that. I think that's very unlikely to work. I mean, Einstein was Einstein, we're not Einstein. Okay, I think it's my attitude. And I think if the final laws can be beautiful, great. If they're not, well, they're not. And I don't think we should go about using aesthetics as a criterion. Is there a center of the universe, like where the Big Bang started off? So, sorry, where are you? I can't even see. <laughs> I've got the light in front. <laughs> where? Oh, there. Okay. <laughs> Should I go on? Is there a center of the universe? Is there a what? A center of the universe. A center. Um, every, but the idea is that no, the universe should be the same everywhere. So whenever I say, I said earlier on, there's no preferred direction in the universe, our belief is that there's no preferred place in the universe as well. So there's no center in the universe. Now, every time you talk about expansion, the temptation is to say, oh, there must be a center if things are expanding. But it's difficult to visualize, but actually, no, there isn't a center. What he's saying is that everywhere you see the same expansion. And this is why I think it's better to have this picture of space being created between things and calling that expansion. So the idea is that there's no center in the universe. Well, I'm not the center, you're not the center. So where is the center? <laughs> um, what little I've read about string theory, I thought string theory gave uh, reasonable, theoretical, acceptable reasons for those numbers, like your fine structure constant. Am I, am I mistaken? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, there isn't. There really isn't. And um, I don't think anyone, actually, string theory does have a varying alpha, curiously enough. So once again, it's the same story. Actually, the problem with string theory is, is, is making alpha not very, very much later on. So string theory is, is actually quite far from fixing the value of alpha where, where we see it. And, um, and there's a number of reasons for that. But, you know, so basically, in string theory, you think there's lots of extra dimensions, which are all curled up and you don't see them. The size of the extra dimensions affects the value of alpha you observe. So if the extra dimensions are varying, alpha is varying, and it's very difficult to fix the extra dimensions at the right size to see alpha the way we see it, actually. So the problem actually gets even worse in string theory, but maybe that's the way to solve it. I'm not sure. But actually, the problem in that respect gets even worse in string theory. Hi there. Thanks for the excellent lecture. Um, I have a question. You posit that there could be no super law, or that there might be no super law that dictates how things change in the universe. And then you argue that we need to measure it by observation. We need to go back to observation to see it. But isn't there a philosophical dilemma there that you could never find it because you would, like, how would you prove that you have found that there is no law that governs everything? No, 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 no. I think, I think, I think there's, there's a language misunderstanding here. So wh when I say that there's no super law, I'm not saying that I cannot write in a mathematical way how the laws are changing. I can do that. What I can't do is write an equation which doesn't have a t, the time inside, which is above everything. 
So I mean, I, I'm still saying there is some kind of formula for C as a function of T. I showed you the plot, in fact, so I'm measuring it. So that doesn't preclude that maybe there is no law without a T inside. That's basically what I'm saying. This, it's a subtle difference, but it's actually a different thing. I'm not saying that the variation in C is unpredictable. It's predictable. It's just that there is no law without a T inside above it. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, hi. Um, haven't they already discovered particles that go faster than the speed of light? Or are they still theoretical ideas? And if so, isn't it then self-evident or obvious then that C talking, isn't just constant? You're talking about tachyons, I think. Yeah, which is, yeah. Well, as far as I know, they, they haven't been discovered. Um, if you look at these variations of varying C in which, um, you know, the speed of light depends on the energy, in a way, energetic photons are tachyons in some respect. Now, you have to be very careful in the way you do this. I mean, if you, if you do this very carelessly, what happens is that you can go back in time, you can kill your grandmother, all kinds of, you know, all hell breaks loose, and you don't, you don't want that, okay? So, so you have to be careful with that. So I wouldn't call this color-dependent speed of light attackion because of that. Um, would you have to have a background-dependent theory rather than a background-independent theory for that to be so? That's some technical question. <laughs> uh, the way we did this is actually even worse. I mean, it's actually frame dependent, full stop. So you break all things, you break relativity. I mean, relativity is based on two things, constancy of the speed of light and the principle of relativity. You don't need to break the second one to break the first. And there are ways of doing it. The way we did it initially broke everything. More recently, we actually have been able to do things background independent, we have. Hi. Um, I was wondering if there's any uh, interaction, I guess, between your theory of the variability of the speed of light and dark energy and dark matter. That's exactly what I'm working on. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is. Uh, it's not obvious what might happen. You know, this is something really recent, last few months. But basically, the idea is that you know, if you look, it's, it's something which I find scandalous, but if you look at the universe, everything except this, you know, the planets and the stars, everything which is in the sky, galaxies and so on, the way they rotate, does not follow Newtonian gravity. So the way we solve the problem is we paint the universe with dark matter that we don't see so that things attract according to Newtonian gravity, which is very unsatisfactory. And some people have claimed that the way you should just take the motions of galaxies face value uh, as an indication for a new theory of gravity. And you see something which was done many years ago by a number of people in Israel. And um, there is a connection with varying speed of light, actually. And it's something, which wasn't, it's something which wasn't obvious to me until about six months ago. And yeah, it's being worked out at the moment, basically. Hi. You say that you can express mathematically the very the changes in you the have to speak louder. Okay. You say that you can express mathematically the changes in the constants. I'm just wondering what implications that has for physics. So it's a very abrupt variation in the beginning of the universe. So it's massive from near infinity to much smaller. And then it's essentially a very it's a very small variation later on. It's a very residual, very small variation later on. But there is actually there's a formula for that. You can work out the formula for that. Yes, uh, a question that um, something I read a long time ago. Gravitational lensing, is that uh, also an effect of change of light speed? The what, say it again? The Gravitational lensing, when, the, when you observe an object and you get uh, reflections sure. of multiple items. You know what that was? That was Einstein's varying speed of light theory, 1911. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, that's, that's one way of looking at it. And he gave it up eventually, not because he drank too much Budweiser or whatever it was, but, but because it was easier to... So the, that perspective says the space is fixed. It's a Newtonian space that's fixed. And then the light speed changes on top of it. Whereas he took the other perspective, that the, the speed of light is locally the same, but the space is changing, is actually curved. And it actually makes a difference. If you look at the 
for instance, the lensing effect, you get a factor of two wrong in the lensing formula. So you can actually disprove Einstein's varying, varying speed of light theory by experiment. In other words, in that way of looking at things, C cannot be varying, it must be space-time curving instead. Um, I'm getting the sign to say that we should take one more question. So if there's one more question, got a mic can we have a microphone down here? Hello. Oh, okay. Thanks. Most of what the cosmologists know is got from the observable universe, and very definite about everything that we know. What percentage of the total universe do you feel the observ the observable universe is? Is this a question about dark matter, or is it a, no? It's a question about the size of the universe. I don't. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's um, it's a question you can answer by observation. Because if the universe is a sphere, you can relate how much you can see with the size, because you can measure the radius of curvature. But it's not very satisfactory. I agree with you. So I don't know. Very appropriate place for <laughs> uh, On behalf of uh, the Perimeter Institute and the University of Guelph, would you join me in thanking Joao for a very entertaining and erudite lecture?